look here, 1858, India was here, China was here, Japan was there, United States and United Kingdom was richer over there, and I will start the world like this. India was not always like this level. Actually, if we go back into the historical record, there was a time hundreds of years ago when the income per person in India, China was even above that of Europe. But 1850 had already been many, many years of foreign domination and India had been de-industrialized. And you can see that the countries who were growing their economy was United States and United Kingdom. And they were also by the end of the century getting healthy. And Japan was starting to catch up. India was trying down here. Can you see how it starts to move there? But really, really the national sovereignty was good for Japan. And Japan is trying to move up there. And at the new century, you know, health is getting better in United Kingdom, United States, but careful now, we are approaching the First World War, and the First World War, you know, we'll see a lot of, 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 of deaths and uh, economical problem here, United Kingdom is going down, and now comes the Spanish flu also, <laughs> and then after the First World War, they continue up, still under foreign domination and without sovereignty, India and China is down in the corner, not much has happened, they have grown their population but not much more. In the 1930s now, you can see that Japan is going to a period a war with lower life expectancy and the Second World War was really a terrible event also economically for Japan but they did recover quite fast afterwards and we are moving into the new world and 1947 India finally gained its independence and they could raise the Indian flag and become a sovereign nation but in very big difficulties down there and in 1949, we saw the emergence of the modern China in a way which surprised the world. And what happens? What happens in the, after independence? Here you can see that the health started to improve. Uh, children started to go to school. Uh, health services were provided. But economy was, this was a great leap forward when China fell down. It was central planning by Mao Zedong. China recovered and they said never more stupid central planning. But they went up here and, and India was trying to follow and they were catching up indeed. And both countries had a better health but still a very low economy. And we came to 1978 and Mao Zedong died and a new guy turned up from the left and it was Deng Xiaoping coming out here and he said doesn't matter if a cat is white or black as long as it catch mice because catching mice catching mice is what the two cats wanted to do and you can see the two cats being here, China and India, wanting to catch the mice over there, you know. And they decided to go not only for health and education, but also starting to grow their economy. And the market reform was successful there. 92 India follows with a market reform. And they go quite closely together. And you can see that the similarity with India and China in many ways are, are greater than the differences with them. And here they march on. And will they catch up? This is the big question today. There they are today. Now what does it mean that the what does it mean that the the average is there this is the average of china if i would split china look here shanghai has already catched up shanghai is already there and it's healthier than the united states huh? but on the other hand guizhou one of the poorest inland provinces of of china is there and if i split guizhou into urban and rural the rural part of guizhou goes down there you see this enormous inequity in china and that's not a bad thing in itself if you have a lot of inequity macrogeographical inequities can be more difficult in the long term to deal with than if it is in the same area where you have a growth center relatively close to where poor people are living. No, there was one more inequity. Look there. United States. <laughs> oh, they broke my frame. Washington DC went out here. My friends at Gapminder wanted me to show this because there's a new leader in Washington who is really concerned about the health system and I can understand him because Washington DC <laughs> Washington DC is so rich over there, but they are not as healthy as Kerala. It's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> now, here we have the whole world. You have the legend down there. And when you see the two giant cats here pushing forwards, you see that 
in between them and in he ahead of them is the whole emerging economies of the world which Thomas Friedman so correctly called the flat world. You can see that in health and education large part of the world population is putting forward but in Africa and other parts as in rural Guizhou in China there are still people with low health and very low economy. We have an enormous disparity in the world but most of the world in the middle are pushing forwards very fast. Now, back to my projections. When will it catch up? I have to go back to a very conventional graph. I will show income per person on this axis instead. Poor down here, rich up there, and then time here. From 1858, I start the world, and we shall see what will happen with these countries. You see, China under foreign domination actually lowered their income and came down to the Indian level here, whereas UK and United States is getting richer and richer, and after the Second World War, United States is richer than UK. But independence is coming here, growth is starting, economic reform grows it faster, and with projections from IMF, you can see where you expect them to be in 2014. Now the question is, when will the catch-up take place? Look at, look at the United States. Can you see the bubble? The bubbles of, not my bubbles, but the financial bubbles. That's a dot-com bubble. This is the Lehman brother <laughs> doorstep there. You see, it came down there. And it seems as the, uh, this, is, this is the northern rock coming down there, you know. <laughs> so they doesn't seem to go this way, these countries. They seem to go in a more humble growth way, you know. And people interested in growth are turning their eyes towards Asia. I, I can compare to Japan. This is Japan coming up. You see, you see, Japan did it like that. We add Japan to it. And there is no doubt that fast catch-up can take place. Can you see here what Japan did? Japan did it like this until full catch up and then they follow with the other high income economies. But the real projections for those ones I would like to give it like this. Can be worse, can be better. It's always difficult to predict, especially about the future. Now a historian tells me it's even more difficult to pr predict about the past, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm in, in, a, in a difficult position here. Inequalities in China and India I consider really the big obstacle. Because to bring the entire population into growth and prosperity is what will create a domestic market, what will avoid social instability and which will make use of the entire capacity of the population. So social investments in health, education and infrastructure and electricity is really what is needed in India and China. You know the climate. We have great international experts within India telling us that the climate is changing and actions has to be taken. Otherwise, China and India would be the countries most to suffer from climate change. And I consider India and China the best partners in the world in a good global climate policy. But they ain't going to pay for what others who have more money have largely created. And I can agree on that. But what I'm really worried about is war. Will the former rich countries really accept a completely changed world economy and a shift of power away from where it has been the last 50 to 100 to 150 years back to Asia? And will Asia be able to handle that new position of being in charge of being the most mighty and governors of the world? So, always avoid war because that always pushes human beings backward. Now, if this inequalities, climate and war can be avoided, get ready for a world in equity, because this is what seems to be happening. And that vision that I got as a young student, 1972, that Indians can be much better than Swedes, eh, is just about to happen. And it will happen precisely the year 2048 in the later part of the summer, in July, more precisely, the 27th of July. The 27th of July, 2048, is my 100th birthday. <laughs> And I expect to speak in the first session of the 39th TED India. Get your bookings in time. Thank you very much.